Okay, welcome everyone. We are going to go ahead and get started now. And as we get started, we're going to mute everyone just so that uh, we have a baseline of muted participants. Okay. And so, hi, my name is Sylvia Chaborski, and I'm with Kearns and West, and I'll be helping to facilitate this meeting today. So I just want to thank you all for your participation. And we recognize that we were hoping to have this meeting in person on the lovely Oregon coast and um, had to switch to a webinar due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we appreciate all of your flexibility in having this online meeting. And I'm just going to spend a few moments going over the process and some of the webinar protocols to try to make this meeting as effective as possible. So as a reminder, this is a uh, task force that is not a federal advisory committee, and so only government bodies are members of the committee. And so we'll be having the task force discussion between 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m., and we value public input as part of the process. And so we'll have a short break after the meeting, and then at 11.20 we'll resume to have an opportunity for public input so that you can make your comments there. And also this meeting is being recorded. And following the meeting, there will be a webinar recording and the PowerPoint presentation and meeting summary available on the BOEM website. I'll go over a few of the webinar operating protocols just to make this meeting as smooth as possible. So first, really important, we just ask you to keep yourself on mute when you are not speaking. And in order to mute yourself, if you're on your phone, you just use your mute and unmute button. However, you'll probably have to press star six the very first time that you want to speak to sort of just get into the system. And then after that, you'll be able to just use your regular mute and unmute buttons on your phone. If you're on your computer, you should have a microphone icon at the top of your screen, this sort of green microphone. Um, and you will just click that to mute and unmute. And then if you want to get in the queue to speak, we ask that you use the raise hand icon, and that's just the little person with their hand raised, and then you'll just enter the queue and we'll call on you, and then you can just lower your hand after you have spoken, and that's just to manage the, the number of people that are speaking. During the meeting, if you want to make the presentation a bit bigger, you can use this sort of four arrows button at the top of your screen to make the presentation full screen to see it better. And then again, members of the public, we ask that you just stay on mute and in listen-only mode until the public comment period, which will open at about 11.20. I'll go over just a few quick ground rules. So just a reminder, we have a pretty tight agenda, so we just ask that we try to stick to that agenda. We ask that you participate actively and respectfully, but please focus your comments and try to keep them as concise as possible so we can get a lot of thoughts into the room. Um, and again, I'll be minding the queue as your facilitator. And when you do speak, just speak clearly and uh, say your name and affiliation each time that you speak, since we can't tell everyone's voice on the phone. And again, just stay muted when you're not speaking. At this point, I'll go through our introductions. And um, we're going to get introductions from task force members at this point. If you are a member of the public, we would encourage you to fill out the poll if you haven't done so already on the bottom left hand of your screen so that we can get a sense of who is um, present today and where you are coming from. And we'll kind of um, let you know what those poll results are later in the meeting before the public comment. And we don't have a sign-in sheet because this is a webinar meeting. So as our virtual sign-in, we would appreciate it if members of the public in the Q&A pod that's on the bottom right, if you could just put in your name, your affiliation, and your email address, we'll just know who was at the meeting, and that will help us. Um, so with that, I'm going to use this slide for introductions. So what I'll do is just list uh, or state the name of each of the agencies and organizations that are part of the task force, and then ask you to introduce yourself. So when I call you, just say your name 
Um, and if you are here and not as a task force member or alternate, but on behalf of a task force member, then please state your name at that time as well. And again, you may need to press star six prior to speaking um, or use the computer icon at the top of the screen if you're joined by computer audio. And if at any time you're not able to introduce yourself, just put your name and affiliation in the Q&A pod and we'll know that you are here. So with that, I will go ahead and read out the first member here. So from the tribes, do we have representatives from the Confederated Tribes of Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Sayusala Indians? Good morning. This is uh, Mark Petrie with the Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Sayusala. And you kind of broke up there at the last. Yeah, I think I did see that we had Mark Petrie on the line. Can you hear me? We, we can, can circle, circle back. back. And from the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ron. Yes, good morning. This is Bruce Edwards, manager of the Historic Preservation Office for the tribe. Do we have Brees Edwards on the line? You may need to press star six on your phone in order to speak. Uh, yes, I'm here. You can hear me. This is Jason Miner with the governor's office, and I am working with the facilitator. I can hear you, um, and I'm trying to work with the facilitation to make sure that they can hear you. So, Brees, I could hear you. Um, I could hear both introductions. Great. Thank you. I appreciate okay, thank it. Thank you, Jason. Explain the lag to everybody who can hear me. Uh, the folks at BOEM cannot hear us, and so they are working to unblock that uh, technical problem. Apologies, just one moment, folks. And again, Jason Miter, Governor's Office, the 180 odd or so folks on the line. Um, uh, the, we're working through the ability for everybody to hear all other speakers, subsets that can hear a variety of. Yeah, so this is Sylvia Kubrick. I think what we'll do is Sylvia Kubrick, and I think County Board of Commissioners. 
from Curry County Board of Trustees. And from Curry County Board of Commissioners. And from Curry County Board of Trustees. And from Curry County Board of Commissioners. Douglas County. Douglas County. Lane County. Lane County. Lincoln County. Lincoln County. Uh, Newport City Council. Uh, Newport City Council. Port of Newport. Port of Newport. And Tillamook County Board of Commissioners. And Tillamook County Board of Commissioners. I think I can see that we have David Yamamoto on the line. I see that we have David Yamamoto on the line. From the Tillamook County Board of Commissioners. From the Tillamook County Board of Commissioners. Okay, well. Okay, well. We'll keep going through our state representatives. We'll keep going through state our representatives. State, representative, state representatives. Do we have anyone here from the Legislative Commission on Indian Services? Do we have anyone here from the Legislative Commission on Indian Services? And the Oregon Department of Energy? And the Oregon Department of Energy? Yes, this is uh, Jason. Welcome, Chairman. Jason. Welcome, Jason. And the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality. And the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality. And Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. And Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Karin Brady. Welcome. Karin. Welcome. Karin. And please put yourself on mute. And please put yourself on mute. Can you please? Sylvia, are you there? This is Andy Lear speaking. I can't hear anything now. Hi, Andy. This is Casey. Um, can you hear me speaking, Andy? Now I can, yes. Okay, great. And I'll continue. I apologize for these difficulties. Um, do we have anybody from the Oregon Department of Geology and Mineral Industries? Okay. And Oregon Department of Justice? And Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development? This is Patty Snow. Welcome. Andy Lanier. Thank you, Andy. And the Oregon Department of State Lands. Okay. And Oregon Governor's Office. Jason Miner, Governor Kate Brown, Natural Resources Policy Director. Thank you, Jason. Oregon Parks and Recreation Department. Laurel Hillman. Welcome, Laurel. And the Oregon State Historic Preservation Office. And now we'll move on to our federal representative from the Bonneville Power Administration. And Bureau of Indian Affairs. I believe we do have Keith Hatch on the line. And the Bureau of Land Management.
I see that we have Tim Barnes on the line. And from the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Yep, there's Doug Boren. I'm the Regional Supervisor for the Office of Strategic Resources for the Boone Pacific Region. Nessie Samai, Renewable Energy Section Chief for the Pacific Region. Whitney Howard, the Boehm Oregon Task Force Coordinator. Thank you. And Lisa? All right, we also have Lisa Gilbane on the line. Thank you. Thank you. And from the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement. And from the Department of Defense. I do see that we have Steve Chung and Steve Sample. Oh, thank you. Hi, Steve. Sorry. Thanks. All right, and from the Federal Aviation Administration. Cindy Witten from the Obstruction Evaluation Group. Welcome, Cindy. Thank you. Federal Communications Commission. Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. This is Chris Wall with NOAA's Office for Coastal Management. Welcome, Chris. And from the National Park Service. And from the NOAA National Marine Fishery Service. This is Keith Hi, Kirkendall this is with. Welcome, Keith. And this is Candace Knackman, yeah, also with NOAA Fisheries. Thank you, Candace. And with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. U.S. Coast Guard. Yeah, I did see that Bill Abadie with the Corps of Engineers is on the Thank you. And with the U.S. Coast Guard. And U.S. Department of Energy. This is Patrick Gilman from the U.S. Department of Energy. Welcome, Patrick. U.S. Department of, of the Interior. And U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. I believe we do have Bridget Lorman on the line. And U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And U.S. Geological Survey. All right, thank you everyone. And apologies for those technical difficulties for a few moments there. I think we are back on track. I'll just review our meeting purpose and agenda, and then we will get into our uh, welcome and introduction. So again, we are here primarily to hear updates from task force members related to offshore wind planning in Oregon, and really primarily to review the draft Oregon Offshore Wind Energy Data Gathering and Engagement Plan and hear your thoughts um, and think about next steps moving forward. And for our agenda today, we'll have opening remarks shortly from the state and from BOEM, and then we'll get into task force member updates and reflections on those updates. And then we'll hear our presentations from Whitney Hauer and Andy Lanier on the data gathering and engagement plan. And then we'll have an opportunity for discussion and your comments and reflections on that plan. We'll then end with the summary and next steps and closing remarks, and then we'll have a brief break before getting into our public input opportunity at 11.20. So at this point, I will turn it over to Doug Boren. Hey, good morning. My name is Doug Boren, and I'm the Regional Supervisor for the Office of Strategic Resources in the Boone Pacific Region. 
I want to welcome welcome you to the eighth meeting of the Boehm Oregon Intergovernmental Renewable Energy Task Force. A lot has happened in the past couple of months since our last meeting in September. I wanted to take a moment to thank our state partners, specifically Jason Miner of the Governor's Office and Andy Lanier and Patty Snow of the Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development for convening the task force in coordination, in coordination with the Boehm Pacific Region to discuss offshore wind planning, offshore Oregon. Additionally, DLCD has been a key partner in the development of the draft Boehm, Oregon Offshore Wind Data Gathering and Engagement Plan, which we will be discussing today. A strong Boehm and Oregon partnership is the foundation and is woven throughout the plan. I also wanted to thank everyone for their patience with the task force meeting planning. We were looking forward to meeting on the Oregon coast back in April and have since been adjusting due to the COVID-19 pandemic. We hope everyone is staying safe and healthy, and I feel many of us have recently increased our ability to participate in meetings remotely. BOEM, as part of the federal government, is moving forward with a phased transition to normal operations in lines with the national guidelines to open the United States. We are also aligned with state and local guidelines. I do want to point out that the Bowen team would prefer to meet in person, and we look forward to seeing all of you at a future in-person meeting when appropriate. We also look forward to the discussion today via webinar. I believe it will be a productive discussion and welcome the task force's input on the draft plan for data gathering and engagement. Lastly, a special thanks to Whitney Hauer, the Oregon Task Force Coordinator and Nessie Sumite, the Pacific Region Renewable Energy Section Chief, as this meeting would not have been possible without their efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. And Jason? Thanks, Doug. Uh, on behalf of the state, I want to welcome and thank everybody participating uh, in this conversation today, and thanks also for being willing to conduct a meeting in a virtual format. Uh, I know uh, many of us have gotten far more used to these technologies than we ever thought we might, and I appreciate your patience, tolerance, um, and everything that uh, it takes to participate. Uh, and I want to echo, we had you know, very much looked forward to and hope to have this conversation on the coast in North Bend. Um, until our plans were cut short uh, due to the coronavirus and the changes that were that took place as a result. Um, you may recall that our uh, initial meeting um, in Portland, uh, I, I spoke I think, clearly and um, want to echo that, that these uh, inputs from the coast and from Oregon's coastal communities uh, are critical in this conversation and I uh, just want to reiterate that I, I was very much looking forward to our planned meeting in North Bend and um, am hopeful that we can have a meaningful presentation and uh, ability to listen to input uh, through this digital format. I also want to thank uh, our co-conveners, um, BOEM and the federal uh, government, and I want to thank all the federal agencies and state agencies and local governments elected officials who are on the line today for being uh, active participants active participants in this conversation. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, our fellow sovereigns, the tribes who are on the line today to participate. Uh, I think the fact that there are 200, now 202 um, voices on the line reflects the importance of this conversation uh, and the, 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 the deep interest that uh, Oregonians feel uh, and deep connection that Oregonians feel uh, to the coast and to our ocean resources. And um, having thanked a variety of uh, affiliations individually, uh, I just want to thank all 202 of us out there um, willing to give time to this conversation. I won't take any more of your time. As has been stated, the purpose of the day is presenting an update and then listening and, uh, and the importance um, of hearing from you. Uh, in, in the importance of hearing from you, I'll cut any comments I have short. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. 
Uh, on behalf of the state, I want to welcome and thank everybody participating uh, in this conversation today. And thanks also for being willing to conduct a meeting in a virtual format. Uh, I know uh, many of us have gotten far more used to these technologies than we ever thought we might. And I appreciate your patience, tolerance, um, and everything that uh, it takes to participate. Uh, and I want to echo, we had, you know, very much looked forward to and hope to have this conversation on the coast in North Bend um, until our planet were cut short uh, due to the coronavirus and the changes that were that took place. There was a <coughs> you may recall that in our uh, initial meeting um, in Portland, uh, I, I spoke thank clearly and. Um, want to echo that, that these uh, inputs from the coast and from Oregon's coastal communities uh, are critical in this conversation. And I uh, just want to reiterate that I, I was very much looking forward to our Thank you, Jason. This is Sylvia Chiborowski again. And I just wanted to also note that Typically at these meetings, we would begin with a tribal blessing and acknowledgement of the ancestral lands where the meeting is taking place. And of course, in this webinar format, we're unable to do that, but it is our intention to do that at future meetings. And I also wanted to just um, say one logistical note. If you are having trouble with the computer audio, if you have joined through computer, it may be best to join by phone to reduce feedback. And that phone number is at the bottom of the welcome screen right now. And if you're having any difficulties, just email Casey Cooper. Uh, if you do join by phone, and a reminder to just mute your computer speakers at that time. So with that, I will move into our time for task force member updates. And again, this is an opportunity for all task force members to provide updates relevant to offshore wind planning efforts. And some of you did email us to let us know that you'd be providing updates. So we will be starting with those that we know about, and then we'll open the floor to others. Well, we're going to start with the federal updates, and then tribal and local, and then end with state updates, because it's our intent for the state update to just lead directly into the subsequent task force discussion. And we ask that when you make your updates, just try to keep it to a few minutes each so that we can hear from as many people as possible. And other task force members, please just hold your questions until after the updates. We'll have a chance for reflection at that time. So first, I will hand it over to, um, to Noah Nymp, to Keith, and a reminder for everyone else to just keep yourself on mute and to unmute yourself, either press star six or your phone um, mute button, or if you're on the webinar, use the microphone button at the top. So Keith. Thank you, Sylvia. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first, I just want to touch on the role that NIMS has in offshore wind. Uh, NIMS is the line office with statutory responsibilities under the Magnuson-Stevenson Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, and the Endangered Species Act, as well as our role as a cooperating agency under the National Environmental Policy Act with BOEM. Um, I want to share with you all, I want to share with you all that uh, NIMS recently stood up a core team for offshore wind from, a from across the West Coast region. We have an interdivisional team, and we also have members from both the Northwest Fishery Science Center and the Southwest Fishery Science Center. So that's, uh, for us, that's pretty exciting. Uh, we're having a kickoff meeting literally tomorrow, uh, and uh, so that's, that's good news. Um, we also acknowledge that we need to coordinate more internally with the, the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. That is all part of our learning curve we're on. It's a steep curve. And relating to that curve, I'm going to turn the mic over to Candace Nachman. Candace is our senior policy advisor from our front office. But more importantly, she has been involved in each step with offshore wind developments along our East Coast. She's going to share with us some insights from that experience. Candice, it's all yours. Thank you, Keith, and good morning, everyone. As Keith mentioned, I'm Candace Nackman with NOAA Fisheries Office of Policy in headquarters. And for us, it's, um, there are a few issues that we've learned from working um, very closely with BOEM on the East Coast of areas that are critical um, for early engagement. 
Um, one area of importance is area identification. And while it might be more time consuming on the front end, we do think it is critical to understand potential impacts and overlays with our trust resources before wind energy areas are finalized and offered for lease. And having this earlier engagement can hopefully lead to fewer use conflicts later on in the process. And to that end, we also highly encourage um, early and, off and, and, um, and consistent engagement with um, stakeholders. NIMS and BOEM's staff on the East Coast have held two workshops since mid-November regarding offshore wind in the Atlantic to discuss methods for earlier engagement regarding our statutory responsibilities. And we are working closely with BOEM headquarters on ways to ensure developers better understand our information needs related to essential fish habitat and endangered species consultations and for marine mammal incidental take authorizations. We encourage developers to engage with NIMS prior to full design of their project to help address concerns early. We also all can acknowledge the challenges that are presented to us by the one federal decision timeline. And again, both NIMS and BOEM on the East Coast have been working to find ways to enhance early coordination with respect to the timelines imposed by this one federal decision process. We hope by building in these engagement points at key milestones throughout the process, it will help us to ease these challenges related to the timelines. We also encourage um, consideration of effects of multiple adjacent projects. Wind energy areas often get broken into multiple leases and often with different developers. We encourage planning for regional transit early in the process with the Coast Guard and other ocean user groups. Identification of transit corridors and appropriate spacing and orientation of multiple adjacent projects prior to any COP submission is critical. Additionally, these decisions can have direct effects on fishing, both commercial and recreational, which need to be considered. Wind development and science is another area that we've been having a lot of conversation on the East Coast. Large-scale development will substantially impact NOAA scientific survey operations, given that they cannot operate in a wind farm, and therefore will impact the data we can collect to help inform our management decisions. At the same time, there remains a critical need to develop a coordinated regional science and research framework to better understand the impacts of projects on our trust resources. I would also like to note the 10-year Memorandum of Understanding that NOAA Fisheries signed in the spring of last year with BOEM and RODA, the Responsible Offshore Development Alliance, that brings local and regional fishing interests together with federal regulators to collaborate on the science and process of offshore wind energy development on the Atlantic. This MOU will help us achieve our strategic national goal of maximizing fishing opportunities while supporting responsible resource development. While there are still gaps in our knowledge about how the installation of wind turbines may impact our fisheries, protected species, and their habitats, we support the establishment of a regional scientific research and monitoring framework to better understand cumulative impacts and potential future interactions of fisheries, protected species, and offshore wind. I just want to end by saying we know that many of our stakeholders are concerned about the pace and potential scale of offshore wind development, but I want to assure everyone that NOAA Fisheries will continue to work cooperatively to provide expertise and advice to BOEM to avoid areas of important fishing activity and sensitive habitats and to help minimize impacts to fisheries, protected species, and their habitats. Thank you. Thank you, Candace. And from the U.S. Department of Energy, Patrick Gilman. Yeah, good morning. Just three three quick things for the group. Um, first, just a reminder that coming out of the last uh, task force meeting, we took an action to develop a floating offshore wind technology 101 webinar for stakeholders. Um, that webinar was delivered by our National Renewable Energy Lab in back in February, and we have since posted that online. It's available to any uh, who are interested, and so I encourage you to check that out. That's um, both posted on our website, uh, on YouTube, and is linked to from BOEM's Oregon State page. Um, second, uh, a reminder to the group that, that we have an extensive research program uh, on the environmental impact of, of offshore renewable energy, both uh, floating up, both offshore wind, floating in fixed bottom, as well as wave and tidal power, um, and our water power office is fi currently finalizing a state of the science report that looks at what's been uh, studied and what's understood about the impacts of, of marine and hydrokinetic, that is to say wave and tidal technologies, 
uh, on um, species and other uh, environmental receptors um, that will be released shortly through the International Energy Agency. And we'll make sure uh, that this group has a link to that when it is released, because there are some things that are common between wave uh, energy and floating offshore wind. Uh, and finally, just this week, we released a request for information soliciting stakeholder feedback on research needs for offshore wind um, to help us plan our R&D uh, spending in that area over the next several years. Uh, we developed that request for information in collaboration with NOAA, um, BOEM, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, and would encourage um, all of the folks on in this group uh, to look at that and consider submitting um, so that we can really take into consideration the needs of, of uh, stakeholders um, mm -hmm. on the West Coast in offshore wind environmental research going forward. Thanks. Thank you, Patrick. And Whitney Hauer at BOEM. Hi, and good morning. This is Whitney Hauer with the BOEM Pacific Office. I'm the BOEM Oregon Intergovernmental Renewable Energy Task Force Coordinator. And there are a few updates from our office that might be of interest to the task force since our last meeting. First, our office initiated the West Coast Renewable Energy Science Exchange webinar series, and it began last November with four webinars to date highlighting scientific research offshore California, Oregon, and Washington. The next webinar presentation is on July 8th, which is an overview of BOEM-funded research about cultural resources on the West Coast, which will be presented by David Ball, who is a marine archaeologist and is the Pacific Regional Historic Preservation Officer at BOEM. Webinar details and past webinar presentations are available through the BOEM Oregon webpage. There have also been several studies completed that relate to offshore renewable energy in Oregon since our last meeting. The studies hand out selected BOEM funded research informing renewable energy offshore Oregon has been included as a part of the meeting materials and is posted on the task force meeting webpage and includes um, the study updates. We won't discuss the studies as a part of this meeting today, but the handout is a resource to the final report for those completed studies. While not offshore wind, the Packwave South project, which is a wave energy test facility proposed by Oregon State University, is under review. On April 23rd of this year, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC, issued the environmental assessment for the Pathways South project with a notice of availability, which includes a 45-day comment period for the environmental assessment, or EA. Um, this this uh, comment period closes next week. BOEM's proposed action is to issue a research lease for the project on the OCS, or the Outer Continental Shelf, and for easements for the five, five subsea transmission cables offshore. Lastly, we distributed to the task force a letter from the Responsible Offshore Development Alliance, or RODA, that was addressed to the Oregon Governor's Office and to our office regarding the task force, as well as the data gathering and engagement plan for offshore wind. RODA is a membership-based coalition of fishing-related companies and associations. We want to thank RODA for their thoughtful comments and welcome the discussion from the task force on their letter during the review of the draft plan this morning. This concludes the BOEM update. Thank you. Thank you, Whitney, and this is Sylvia. Are there any other updates from federal task force members? If you have any, you can go ahead and raise your hand. And in the interest of time, I'll just keep going, and if we see any hands, we'll just come back. So I think we have Steve Sample. Hi, thanks. Uh, yes, I'd like to go. Just, just wanted to um, thank you for hosting. This idea of these an active participant in this task force to ensure that offshore development plans remain compatible uh, with important testing, training, and operations in and around Oregon. And, and for DOD, that's a lot of people that are on this call, uh, both in Oregon and, and here where I am in D.C. And, and the way that we have organized this is my boss, the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Sustainment, uh, directed the Navy and, and specifically Steve Chung in the region uh, to be DOD's lead for the task force. So Steve and I uh, work very closely to make sure that, that we've got uh, the, the local and the national bases covered so that we're, you're getting a, a thorough single voice from DOD. Uh, so, so we're here, and I, and I think I'd like to ask Steve if he has something to add. 
Thank you for having me. We're not hearing anything from Steve Chung. Okay, well, we'll move I into... On. I know he's on. It must be a mute issue, but we'll, we'll get it later. Thank you. All right. Thank you. We'll move into our tribal updates then, starting with Mark Healy. And Mark, you may need to press your unmute button or star six. Hello, good morning. Good morning. My name is Mark Healy. I'm the Water and Environmental Specialist for the Coquel Indian Tribe. The tribe thanks Baum, DLCD, Kearns West, and others for gathering this task force. Um, offshore wind has the potential to provide us sustainable and resilient energy with a lower greenhouse gas footprint, but it also has promised to provide us renewable energy jobs, maritime work, a reliable coastal grid, and other opportunities for economic growth. I feel it is time to move quickly to determine if offshore wind could provide us a sustainable and resilient energy future. I appreciate very much the webinars and informed studies from BOEM, NREL, PNNL, NOAA, DLCD, ODO, POET, and many others. I hope we can use our time in 2020 to find any existing data gaps and move quickly to complete those studies. We need a full upfront understanding of effects on the fisheries and fishing industry, seabirds, whale migration, and other ecosystem effects. We also need to fully understand the offshore wind levelized cost of energy as compared to other energy sources. We should prioritize our time to collect high resolution seafloor bathymetry and physical data such as wind, weather, wave at potential call areas. Planning or implementation of these studies should begin this year. I am a member of OCEAN, Oregon Coastal Energy Alliance Network to assist in learning about and developing a vision of potential offshore wind development. OCEAN has already begun engagement with our local community and leaders and will be an asset during this data gathering and engagement planning effort. Finally, I feel an important role for this task force will be to assist in developing energy policies for offshore wind that are consistent with the territorial sea plan, tribal, state, and federal goals, and as always, consistent with the wise use of our ocean. Thank you for considering my comments. Thank you, Mark. And I believe we also have an update from Mark Petrie with the Confederated Tribes of Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Sayusala Indians. Yes, can you, can you hear me? We can. Great. Good morning, everyone. Diestis, Menhuas, Mark Petrie, Ta and Kukwisma. Uh, my name is Mark Petrie. I'm a Honus Kus descendant, and I represent the Confederated Tribes, the Kus, Lower Mekwan, Sayusla Indians, where I also serve as the, the vice chair of our tribal council. And I'd, I'd first like to state that uh, since time immemorial, our tribe here has had a strong and deep connection to coastal resources and landscapes. Our language, technology, and spirituality evolved through a direct relationship with this landscape. And our Aboriginal territory is rooted at 1.6 million acres of the Southern Oregon coastal landscape, extending westward 12 nautical miles beyond the continental shelf. Specifically, the tribe's ancestral territory is defined with the northern boundary at 10 Mile Creek, just north of the Cedar Head, and the southern boundary at five mile point between the mouths of Whiskey Run Creek and Cut Creek, then eastward to the crest of the coast range. Uh, as for our updates, um, offshore wind efforts, um, I've, I've also had the pleasure of sitting on the, the group known as OCEAN, as Mark Healy um, just mentioned before, which is based here in Coos Bay. And uh, a few updates from, from this group. Uh, through OCEAN's advocacy, 
offshore wind and coastal energy security will be included in Oregon Department of Energy's 2020 Biennial Energy Report. OCEAN was also established as an actively engaged stakeholder at the Oregon Public Utility Commission capacity and distribution system planning dockets, as well as in the PUC response to Executive Order 20-04. And lastly, the affiliated tribes of Northwest Indians and Ocean were also established as stakeholders in the Oregon Department of Energy's Oregon Renewable Energy Siting Assessment Project with respect to offshore wind and isolated frontline community energy perspectives. And uh, I would like to thank all of the, the tribal, federal, state, and local partners on the call today and throughout for your time and energy spent on researching this uh, renewable energy, these opportunities off of our coast and what it means to you, your constituents, and the seven generations coming to the future. And in light of the consequences of not addressing climate change, I would, I would urge that we not delay in our efforts to create an inclusive path towards developing clean renewable energy. I'd like to thank the BOEM and other federal agencies that were able to put this call together for us to collaborate and work together on this effort. Louis, thank you. Thank you. And we saw that Steve Sample is now able to get back on. So Steve, do you have a quick update to add? Uh, can you hear me now? We can. Okay, fantastic. Uh, yeah, it's uh, got to love IT challenges. Uh, I wanted to go ahead and thank Steve Sample for that quick point, but uh, real, real quick uh, overview, I think uh, I just want to share that uh, DOD appreciates uh, the ongoing and continued outreach and collaboration on this uh, initiative, but also to share for some initial awareness, uh, we do believe it's important to share uh, just some salient points regarding DOD activities occurring uh, along the Oregon coast. Uh, so uh, this will be a quick high level, but a uh, important soundbite for all the stakeholders and our stakeholders that are not on task force uh, to have some level of awareness. Uh, the Department of Defense conducts operations within areas offshore designated as uh, warning areas. Uh, these areas are routinely utilized by aviation, uh, surface, and subsurface DOD assets for required training events to implement the national defense strategy. And for uh, members and stakeholders that are on the line, just a quick uh, snapshot of some of these over uh, operations. Uh, they do include joint air to surface and air to air operations, uh, combat tactics, NSF, aerial refueling, instrument training, formation flight training to outline a few. But additionally, uh, these critical training assets also enable the Department of Defense to conduct complex and coordinated subsurface operations. Uh, so that being said, um, we look forward to continue our collaboration with our agency and industry partners in coordination with our local and regional military colleagues from the Pacific Coast Partnership. Uh, I believe many of them are currently on the line. I uh, just want to go ahead and outline our uh, boots on the ground conduit there with uh, Ms. Kim Peacher and Mr. Taylor Tidwell, who may be on the line. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide input. I will now go on mute. Thank you, Steve. And we are um, a little behind in our agenda, but we'll keep going in our updates from local government updates. I believe we did have um, an update expected from Curry County Commissioner Court voice, but I'm not sure if you're on the line, Court. Can you hear me okay? We can. Hey, I'll go fast. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present. I think I just sent you a copy of, and probably a month or two as well back, I forwarded you a copy of our county resolution. I won't read it all, but if you want to make it available, it's just a project we're very excited. Uh, you know, we're we're the little stepbrother of Coos County, but they've been very supportive of us in, in a variety of ways since I became commissioner three and a half, whatever years ago. And uh, we want to support the, the port of Coos Bay uh, for what they can bring in economic development. And, uh, you know, I sometimes have fun reminding people that uh, the Curry coastline, uh, basically Coos Bay to Brookings, 
has the, uh, the it's the most rugged, unique, and beautiful part of the entire Western North America. So when Jedediah Smith come through here 20 years after the uh, Lewis and Clark expedition, he found these giant trees and a redwood and Douglas firs, the incredibly pristine rivers, the rugged coastline. I'm sure he thought at that time, someday there's going to be offshore wind here. So <laughs> uh, like I say, have a little bit, little fun with that, but we do have world-class winds. And uh, in concluding here, I'm, I'm certainly available for questions. I, I want to respect your time though. Uh, the, the very end of our county resolution, uh, uh, delineate, de, delineate uh, clean, reliable, cost-effective renewable energy from ocean winds, coastal energy resilience, carbon-free renewable energy sources, local control over the future of energy, significant investment in local infrastructure, reliable family wage jobs. So I've been very impressed with uh, the people just in my county alone, but, but throughout the Southwest Oregon region that recognize the potential here. And when you uh, make the statement and remind people of renewable marine energy possibilities, uh, it, it, it really is uh, generating a lot of interest. That's all I have for now. Thank you. Back to mute. Thank, thank you, Commissioner. Any other local updates? You can go ahead and raise your hand. And I do also want to note that we just learned that the BOEM website is down and the agency is working to get it back up as soon as possible. So that may be part of some of the troubles um, with the technology today. So apologies for that. And I don't see any hands up. So I will turn it over to state updates at this time. I believe Jason Stearman with the Oregon Department of Energy has an update. And Jason, we can't hear you if you are speaking. You may need to press star six or unmute yourself. How about now? Yes. Great. Okay, Jason Stearman here with the Oregon Department of Energy. Um, we at the state are picking up um, work on an Oregon Renewable Energy Siting Assessment. So this is our hopefully quick five-minute update for the group. Um, the project has managers from Oregon Department of Energy, Department of Land Conservation, and also Oregon State University's Institute for Natural Resources. A little background, um, energy markets, energy customers, and energy policies are all expected to continually drive opportunities for energy development in the coming decades. So with this in mind, the state is in the early stages of beginning a renewable energy siting assessment to help inform stakeholders with an interest in the development of energy infrastructure. So potential stakeholders are a lot of the usual suspects, but a few would include public and local communities, tribes, advocacy groups, nonprofits, and other NGOs, local agencies, state agencies, federal agencies, um, military, and the energy industry, energy project developers, and folks up and down supply chains that feed into energy project development. A little bit about the project itself. Um, it's an assessment that is going to be aimed at working with stakeholders to gather input and data to help raise to help raise awareness of development compatibility needs and provide educational tools to identify potential project areas that may be more or less compatible with other uses and interests. Um, it's going to inform stakeholders to help everyone prep and plan for potential development. Broad assessment that strives to receive input from a wide variety of stakeholders, collect information about potential locations current and future renewable energy and transmission development, and build an understanding of the constraints and opportunities that may come with specific locations. So I um, wanted to unpack a few of those things for folks, like energy markets um, kind of drive the, the market for new and large-scale commercial projects to be cost competitive. So we probably all are broadly aware of what kind of projects are currently cost competitive, um, solar, of course. Um, onshore wind. Um, with respect to offshore wind on the West Coast, um, and based on the uptick in interest from researchers, industry, developers, military, coastal communities, and um, 
to some extent the gathering of the Boeing task force itself here, um, we're seeing that it's possible that floating offshore wind costs could potentially become cost competitive in the future. So um, offshore wind will be included in the state's assessment. Um, um, and part of the assessment that we're going to do is going to be um, an update, well, an update to kind of the current literature out there that has done some, some cost projections. But one pillar of our assessment um, at the state level here is going to be um, uh, an assessment of energy markets and energy industry um, with the help of E3, a consultant that we recently brought on board. Um, we're in the middle of bringing on board a few other consultants to help us with similar assessments, um, just based on different topic areas. So the other two assessments, again, the first assessment, I guess, if you were to put them in order, um, the order doesn't mean anything, but just for my mental <laughs> checklist here, um, uh, the energy markets and energy industry assessment, and then there'll be a um, natural resource, environmental, and development constraints an opportunities assessment, and a military impact assessment. Um, skipping ahead to the key deliverables from this, um, at the end of the project, which probably we're just really ramping up, so um, I'll say stay tuned, and I'm, I'm happy to provide more project info um, on a later call. Um, but the, the key deliverables we're scoping for this project to end, which would be probably a year from now um, at the earliest, would be a report, an energy siting report, and an energy siting mapping tool for the state. Um, and that's going to have a lot of GIS later, layers. Um, going to point to um, our DLCD kind of liaison for this project with um, BOEM. Um, his name's Andy Lanier. I think he's going to talk about some of the existing data efforts that have been done. Um, the West Coast Ocean Data Portal um, will speak to you. So we're expecting um, to leverage existing data um, to feed into our ORESA, is the acronym, Oregon Renewable Energy Siting Assessment Project. Um, and if there's other questions kind of on, on what I've tried to paraphrase here pretty quickly for everybody, um, I'm happy to help answer those towards the end. Um, or talk offline if people want to try to get in touch with me. I'm sure my contact info is, is pretty easy to find. Um, so hopefully that is a pretty good overview in a nutshell. Thank you, Jason. And we also see that we have a couple of people that um, have additional thoughts, but I will turn it over to Jason Miner with the governor's office to provide the state updates, and then we can continue hearing from Bob Main and others who want to speak during the discussion portion. So, Jason? Thanks, and I will, I might have to uh, try a technology trick to make sure that my voice doesn't repeat after uh, my remarks as I did last time. Thanks, everybody, for those updates. Many of my updates echo what's already been said, and I'll try to be brief. Um, but uh, during our last conversation in the fall, I think that conversation was largely around as a task force uh, and as a public, that conversation was largely around um, the issue of either conducting a planning process or, uh, or the, the reality that in the absence of a planning process, unsolicited uh, applications may come forward. Um, the planning process, we understand in the state, uh, may lead to potential selection of potential wind energy areas, and that that is one approach uh, for going forward around issues of wind energy development and designation of areas on the outer continental shelf, outer, outer continental shelf for offshore wind. Um, and our understanding is the alternate approach, the alternative approach is no planning, and then in that scenario, uh, a company could um, could receive an, uh, or could apply for an unsolicited in an unsolicited area and make a lease request to BOEM. Um, and that that would be a different, uh, different approach. I think the state has a long history of commitment to spatial planning or land use planning system and spatial planning in the marine environment. Um, and in September, uh, the state and BOEM uh, were asked to collaborate and work together to put together a draft plan for engagement and outreach, uh, which comes before you for a comment today, as well as data coordination. Um, 
and uh, you know, and today we were we're responsive to that request and um, bringing that work forward. Uh, updates I haven't yet heard. Um, the state's ocean policy advisory council met in um, October of 2019 in Boehm, and the state presented this work to the council um, staff from DLCD as well as Boehm presented there and uh, and discussed the state's authority under the Coastal Zone Management Act. The council heard public comment at the time, deliberated, and ultimately uh, OPAC agreed to recommend to the governor that the state engage in the planning process um, that I just described and have someone on the council able to represent OPAC at the task force. Um, that letter was delivered to the governor's office in March of 2020. Um, it's my understanding Walter Chuck, uh, the current chair of OPAC, was added to the task force uh, following that meeting uh, as, as a port representative um, and I believe uh, I believe he may be joining us today. Um, as people have already addressed, other folks in the line have already addressed. The group's been established in Southern Oregon Ocean that's promoting the discussion regionally um, on the coast, on the south coast, and holding some regular working group meetings, as I understand it. And I've heard a little bit about today and other updates. I've been active in building partnerships in the region and reaching out to a variety of entities and partners. Um, so that organization and that organization's input is a new state update that, uh, to my knowledge, wasn't present in the fall. Um, as Commissioner Boyce just discussed, Curry County is signed a resolution in support of um, the growth and offshore wind industry. And as DOD and um, ODO just discussed, uh, the state has received a grant from DOD to be working on a renewable energy assessment to inform planning um, in both the terrestrial and marine environments. And I know and have routinely coordinated with ODO on progress on that work. Um, so those are a number of uh, updates uh, regarding, um, I think, a greater dissemination and awareness of marine spatial planning. Uh, the, the planning process as it relates to wind energy areas and really, the, the sorry, the dichotomy and the the the, the choice um, on the table regarding wind potential wind energy areas, uh, either to plan um, or to um, be uh, be more at the whim of um, unplanned events. And I think, given all of those preceding facts, um, the state is decided uh, to commit to conducting a planning process with BOEM um, and to engage in data gathering, gathering of uh, public input, um, and true engagement. Uh, I think I will commit to this group, the state will invest the time and energy to not just listen, but also to engage uh, the voices of the state and of the coast to gather information necessary to move forward. And I just want to acknowledge that in the in this area, in, in the in the events of the past couple of months, um, uh, with the challenges to our uh, our 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 community infrastructure, um, that it, it's more apparent now than ever that resilient systems are important, and that um, we are committed to making sure that no use fishing research. Uh, suffer at the at the at the expense of a new use, and so uh, in going forward and engaging in a planning process, uh, I recognize the comments that have been, been made to date that there needs to be more gathering of information regarding current status of fisheries, um, impacts to fisheries, and that that data that, that information needs to come from um, from fishermen, from fishing communities, from researchers associated with fishing. And that information is perhaps a gap that uh, needs to be addressed, as well as other gaps, um, so that this is a complete, robust process that uh, does not um, does not uh, marginalize an existing use um, to create an opportunity for new uses. Our food systems, the approach that Oregon has taken uh, during the coronavirus um, 
has, has been uh, different than many states. We did not designate essential services and non-essential services, but the approach we did take uh, recognized that fishing and our food systems, uh, agriculture as well, are need to be resilient and are essentially the same as essential essential services. So, I think with that um, with that recognition uh, and recognizing the the, the 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 persisting need for resiliency in our fishing communities, um, we are committed to going forward in a way that engages in the planning process and and engages the communities that uh, both stand to benefit uh, and uh, can accurately perceive the risks of moving forward. Um, and with that, I'll just thank you for taking the time to, uh, to listen to my updates, and I look forward to the rest of the agenda. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate that. And this is Sylvia Chaborowski. And at this point, we will open it up to a short discussion and reflections on the task force member updates before we get into our presentation. And I'm going to first turn it over to Doug Boren um, to respond to the state updates. And then next in the queue, we will have Bob Main and David Yamamoto. So Doug? Great. Thanks, Sylvia. And I just wanted to say I wanted to thanks, Jason. Uh, you know, wanted to provide a quick update, just to, some feedback on, you know, what you said just a few minutes ago. You know, I wanted to let everyone know that BOEM is committed to working and collaborating with the state to engage in the planning process. Uh, you know, our office plans to dedicate the resources needed to ensure that the data gathering and engagement process is meaningful and effective. We expect the results of, from the process to inform the identification of a potential, potential call area or areas that are appropriate for leasing. I realize the topic of discussion later this morning is the plan for this engagement effort, and I'm interested in hearing feedback on the plan that is being drafted thus far. So again, we appreciate it. Thanks, Jason, and I'll turn it back over to you, Sylvia. Thank you, Doug. And I just want to note, if anybody is still having issues hearing the audio, if you're joined by your computer, we really do encourage you to call in using your phone, using the conference number and access code that are at the bottom of the screen. And I'll turn it over to Bob Main. Bob, Hello? you may need to take yourself off mute. Yes, we can hear you now. Oh, good, good, good. It was delayed. Uh, I have several comments. Uh, one is I have read and studied the rotor letter that was just sent. And uh, I would agree that the fishing community should be at the front end of the process instead of at the back end of the process. It would uh, save a lot of um, angst by the fishing community. Um, I am not, on another subject, I'm not in favor of feed and tariff, which the only two wind energy projects in the United States are on the East Coast, which were guaranteed uh, by the rate payers. I'm not in favor of the rate payers guaranteeing one of these projects. Also, I may have missed it, but uh, I did not see a study of the ocean seafloor and the geological strata to support the anchors. And lastly, I do support the Port of Coos Bay for the potential manufacturing and wind energy components. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. And David Yamamoto. Uh, yes, good morning. Thank you. This is Tillamo County Commissioner Dave Yamamoto. Uh, I, I appreciate uh, all the updates from federal, tribal, local, and state governments. Uh, I very much appreciate your concerns about fisheries uh, and the environment, uh, renewable energy, uh, renewable energy, resilience, urgency, climate change, national defense strategy, energy markets, cost competitiveness, um, and that's all great. Uh, I do have to uh, give a shout out to Curry County Commissioner Kurt Boyce. Uh, one of the issues that he brought up, and, and that's my major concern here, is local control of renewable energy. Um, one of the things that was made loud and clear at our last meeting in, in Newport uh, from the Coastal Caucus and from our federal congressional delegation uh, was the fact that we need to make sure that we have input from the coastal communities. And, and again, uh, meetings in, uh, in Portland and taking public comments at that meeting uh, is not sufficient. 
So I appreciate very much uh, Boehm uh, recognizing that we need to hold meetings up and down the coast. Then we got the, this pandemic, which, and again, the front line of, of all the pandemic work being done uh, is the county commissioners. I mean, we're, we're getting great direction from the state and the feds, but when it actually comes to implementation, uh, it's all being done by the county commissioners all across Oregon at this point. And our time is limited, uh, but we cannot get away from the fact that we need to hold public meetings up and down the Oregon coast to make sure that we have that local input. And I think that that's very important. Um, Jason Miner, I appreciate very much that you, you want true public engagement. Uh, I don't think we're there yet. I don't think we've even uh, scratched the surface uh, on that public engagement. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to the time where we can, again, re-engage with communities on the Oregon coast. Um, this is a great interim step, uh, having these types of webinars. Uh, but again, being on the ground uh, in front of people, uh, seeing what their concerns are, it, to me, is of, of paramount importance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Yamamoto. And this is Sylvie Chiborowski again. That leads very nicely into our next topic, which is going into presentation on the draft data gathering and engagement plan. If there are additional thoughts on the updates, we'll just ask for those to be held until our next discussion period so we can go through these presentations as well. So next we'll hear a presentation from Whitney Hauer on the engagement plan and then also from Andy Lanier on the Ocean Data Catalog and Visualization Tools. And we ask that you hold your comments and questions until after both of those presentations. Um, you can go ahead and put your, raise your hand to get in the queue at that, but we won't call on you until after both of the presentations. And you can also um, submit any questions or comments through the Q&A chat. So with that, I will turn it over to Whitney Hauer. Hi, thanks, Sylvia. This presentation details the draft um, BOEM Oregon Data Gathering and Engagement Plan for Offshore Wind Energy. The plan was developed as an action item from our last task force meeting last September for the purpose of soliciting feedback from the task force on offshore wind planning in Oregon. The plan was drafted by Kearns and West, contracted through our office at BOEM, um, with significant input from BOEM and, and Oregon DLCD um, throughout, this, throughout the draft. The draft was distributed to the task force members in March of this year in preparation for the task force meeting originally scheduled for early April, and the draft is posted to the BOEM Oregon webpage. I'll summarize the contents of the 28 pages in the report and look forward to the discussion later this morning. Um, I should have asked you to advance to the first slide. Um, all right, to the next slide. Thank, thank you. So the, the purpose of the plan is to outline how BOEM and DLCD will engage with research organizations and potentially interested and affected parties, and also to gather data and information to inform potential offshore wind planning and leasing decisions offshore Oregon. How the data is gathered and visualized will be detailed in Andy's presentation following this one. The figure in this, in this slide is a general timeline of BOEM's renewable energy competitive leasing process. It's important to note that all of the activities described in this plan would be used to inform potential leasing decisions, including a call for information, which is indicated as the start button on the left side of this figure. The proposed plan, planning effort is an opportunity to take lessons learned from other states and to develop an outreach and engagement process that is effective for Oregon. Next slide. The, the plan includes overall goals with associated objectives as well as guiding principles beginning on page nine. However, I'd like to review the overall three goals, which include first, that interested and affected parties are informed of the data and information gathering process for offshore wind planning and have meaningful opportunities to provide input. The second is that best available data and information are collected to inform potential offshore wind planning and leasing decisions offshore Oregon. And third, that BOEM and the state will build partnerships and a sense of shared ownership of offshore wind planning with interested and affected parties. Next slide. The planning area for the data and information collect collection spans the entire Oregon coast, which is due to the input that we received at the last meeting where task force members shared that the planning should be a statewide activity. The planning area is the outer 
outer continental shelf where offshore wind is technically viable. The area is bound to the east with Oregon's territorial sea and to the west with water depths of 1,300 meters. And this entire area has an average wind speed of greater than seven meters per second. Due to the geographic area extending offshore the entire coastline, the planning area is categorized into three sub-areas for the purposes of planning and engagement and include the north, central, and south coast. Next slide. The outreach messages will be consistent across all of our materials and communications and updated as any new issues or concerns arise. The overall initial messages include that BOEM's planning and leasing process consists of various phases over several years and includes multiple opportunities for public input. BOEM and the state are engaged in the planning process to gather data and information to conduct outreach and conduct outreach to understand these opportunities and challenges of offshore wind that will inform future leasing decisions, that offshore wind has the potential to provide a new source of renewable energy and that floating offshore wind is likely to be used offshore Oregon. And lastly, that understanding the environment and the uses of offshore wind planning um, are critical to planning. And the primary focus is to gather data that identifies existing environmental information and uses. Next slide. There have been four initial groups with, that have been identified in part of this plan with tailored approaches to address specific interests. We acknowledge that there, is, there may be overlap between groups and the effort was to be more in, inclusive of groups and not to exclude any interest or potentially affected parties. The four parties are identified as first the tribes that BOEM will work to identify each with each ident federally recognized tribe to identify the preferred method of engagement. The second is research organizations tailored to identify and collect the best available data and information relevant to offshore wind planning. The third is ocean users to include ports, the fishing industry, and tourism. And this becomes um, twofold, really to in inform ocean users of the offshore wind planning efforts, and then also to identify and collect data information on ocean uses relevant to offshore wind. And lastly, to the coastal communities and the general public, again, to inform the public of the offshore wind planning effort, and then also to identify and collect any relevant data to offshore wind planning. Next slide. Stage 14 in this plan details the proposed schedule, which begins with the task force meeting here today. We've proposed a 12-month data gathering and engagement effort. Generally speaking, uh, after the task force input on this plan and the plan is finalized, plan Im implementation can begin with preparation this summer and fall. Over the course of this fall and next spring, BOEM, DLCD, and some task force members, as appropriate, would begin engagement. On page 11, there is a table that captures the different types of engagement ranging from conference calls, small group meetings, websites, email updates, webinars, and public meetings. We would capture the findings of engagement in a final report with the plan to convene a task force meeting to discuss the following summer. We would plan to provide updates on the BOEM website and email information, um, informative updates to the task force and other audiences throughout the process. Next slide. I want to pause for a moment. This plan was distributed in mid-March, and by the end of March, most states, or many states, including Oregon and California, which is where the Bone Pacific office is lo located, uh, were under stay-at-home orders. While the, one of the guiding principles of this plan is to be flexible and adaptive, I can tell you that no member of the working team envisioned the COVID-19 pandemic that has impacted everyone's work in one way or another. With respect to this plan, the most impacted area is with the proposed public meetings along the Oregon coast and in Portland and in Salem. I welcome the discussion from the task force members on the level of virtual engagement that can be used as a part of this plan. BOEM and the state would follow federal, state, and local guidelines regarding any travel and in-person meetings with respect to the pandemic. We understand there are some organizations that have quickly adapted to having staff telework with their participation in webinars that have increased without the need to accommodate for travel. While today, others may not have the capacity to engage or have limitations in engaging remotely. And I'd also uh, note David Yamamoto's um, comments as well. Next slide. On the topic of the organizations that we would engage with throughout this process, 
on, in the appendix, is that there are five pages listing specific organizations. However, they can be broadly categorized as the ones listed on this slide. There is overlap between groups, and we welcome if there are any organizations that are not listed. Generally speaking, there are governmental bodies and tribes, which includes many members of the task force, but also expand to other members, elected officials, and public utility districts. The research organizations, including universities, national labs, and so on. Commissions, councils, and associations, some of which may have a quasi-governmental role. Environmental groups, including environmental justice and NGOs. The offshore wind industry, the ocean users and interest groups, and the coastal communities and interest groups. Next slide. As far as the next steps for this implement engagement plan, um, we are here right now with the task force to input and, and look forward to the, to the meeting discussion. If task force members want to provide written feedback, please use the comment tracker form and send feedback in one week from today, which is June 11th. Um, and send to, to me, Whitney Howard, by email. After, um, after this discussion and any written feedback, Kearns and West, with input from Bowman DLCD, will incorporate the feedback into the plan and finalize um, the final plan would then be distributed to the task force sometime this summer. That concludes my presentation, and I'd like to hand it over to Andy Lanier for his presentation on the data catalog and visualization tool. Thank you. Good morning, folks. This is Andy Lanier, Marine Affairs Coordinator for the Department of Land Conservation and Development. Just pausing to confirm you can hear me. Yes. OK, next slide, please. So I would like to take a few moments to cover Oregon's legacy of ocean planning. Um, as I've been asked to discuss the issue of data cataloging, organization, and dissemination, uh, providing a background on our state agency's role as a, as a program uh, will be helpful in understanding how we will uh, be responsive to the needs moving forward. And to begin with, that starts with the statewide planning goal 19. Uh, that's the, my favorite statewide land use planning goal of 19 goals, uh, with the exception of goal one, which is public involvement in planning. But since 1977, goal 19 has guided uh, the state's development of ocean policy and management of our ocean resources. Goal 19 recognizes the balance between conservation and development, which can be thought of as resource protection versus utilization. And Goal 19 has specific policy preference statements embedded in that to guide the state as it evaluates potential new uses. The foundation of that balance is good information for decision making. Without it, uh, we operate uh, blind and, and are more likely to make decisions that are not beneficial for the state. Goal 19 was acknowledged and built upon with passage of Oregon's Ocean Resources Management Act, uh, sometimes short, shorthand called the, o the Ocean Plan. And that, uh, that act was put in place uh, in response uh, to the passage of Goal 19 and in uh, the instance that the state needed to plan comprehensively uh, as a way of informing the issue of offshore oil and gas extraction interest on the outer continental shelf. As a part of that act, uh, the Territorial Sea Plan and Ocean Policy Advisory Council uh, were a result of that, uh, that effort. The Territorial Sea Plan was created to formalize the framework for decision making and serve as a coordinating mechanism for the purpose of documenting the methods and criteria for evaluating new proposed uses of the ocean. Uh, the Ocean Policy Advisory Council was established uh, as the state's legislatively established stakeholder advisory body. And it has the job of stewarding the territorial sea plan as new potential uses of the ocean come to the state. During my time as a staff member for the department, I have been involved in uh, marine spatial planning in one way or another since uh, I joined the department in 2007. Uh, in particular, I have now assisted with uh, the amendment of our 
uh, part five of the Territorial Sea Plan, which is developed for marine renewable energy. We have currently an ongoing effort to amend our Rocky Habitat Management Strategy, which is part three. And we have uh, a requested amendment to part four, which is subsea cables, pipelines, and utilities, uh, that is on our lineup for amendments in the coming year. For each and every one of those efforts, the coastal program as a coordinating entity for the state has served as the data catalog uh, steward and archiver of each of those uh, resource inventory catalogs that were generated and used as a part of the decision-making process. And then finally, as Oregon's federally approved coastal zone management program, the state has already received uh, automatic project review authority through the submission and approval of what is called a geographic location description, or GLD. Uh, that document describes and provides an analysis of ocean, use sources and ocean uses and resources from the perspective of reasonably foreseeable adverse effects. So it connects what happens out in uh, depth range of 500 fathoms to shore and how those resources uh, are not necessarily bound by administrative boundaries of the state federal government. Next slide, please. So as technical staff uh, person responsible for helping to facilitate those policy processes and as someone who has uh, built data catalogs over time, we wanted to list the guiding principles of a data catalog that we are proposing to use. First, uh, our data catalog should be easy to search, well organized, and provide multiple ways to find the available data. The best analogy I can think of to date is when you search on Amazon, you have a number of different ways to find what you're looking for. The same should be true of looking for data and information for our policy process. The second principle is that we want to ensure public access to the information and data throughout our engagement and planning process. That is crucial for entities who are interested to understand what information the state has to consider uh, the potential impacts and compatible uses for the ocean. Third is that data that we include in our catalog should have uh, accurately described source method methods and documentation for each of the available resources, and those should be provided through uh, FGDC compliant metadata, or that's the federal standards for sharing of data. And then where possible, uh, we want to receive the data from the authoritative source uh, that is providing the data, rather than from a third party who is hosting uh, the data through some other means. Uh, that principle allows and uh, keeps the authenticity of the data correct. It allows the source provider to update their information when they need to, and will ensure that the data that we are referencing does not go out of date. And then finally, uh, considering uh, our economic status as a state and as, as a country uh, because of our response to coronavirus, it's really important that we continue to use existing technology and infrastructure where possible and to leverage existing resources. Next slide, please. So my last point brings me to talk about the resources we are planning to leverage and take advantage of, which is the West Coast Ocean Data Portal. Uh, the West Coast Ocean Data Portal is a, is, has been the data catalog and visualization tool for the West Coast Ocean Alliance. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with that uh, policy body for previous incarnations of it, which included the uh, regional planning body effort, as well as its predecessors, uh, the West Coast Governors Alliance on Ocean Health. So as a staff person uh, for our program, uh, which has been a member of the Alliance and those previous entities, I have been involved in the construction and the management and maintenance of the data portal through time since its inception in 2012. Both the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and the State of Oregon have contributed, contributed a lot of time to the development of the site 
and will continue to work together on the generation of the resources to provide a data catalog to support offshore wind as well as a visualization tool that is customized to provide the data relevant to viewing information on the outer continental shelf. One final note about the data portal is that it is built upon uh, open source code. So uh, you know, anyone can understand and potentially uh, use our documentation to build a similar system to help their needs. So by building the system and continuing to invest in it, we are investing in the community of data uh, practitioners around the West Coast. Next slide, please. The catalog system provides an efficient way to support and search through a large amount of records, identify where to access, and to view information about whom to contact if the data is already not publicly available through some other source. We have organized the records in the catalog around the Marine Data Ontology, which is a hierarchical organization scheme of the themes of ocean-related data but it is also curated for specific topical themes. One of the strengths of this effort is that a user coming to the data portal can search by keyword, location, category, uh, by the source of the data that's providing it, as well as through the specific themes that the catalog administrators have curated uh, explicitly for that purpose. When you open up or expand any individual record, you will see the, the ways that they are available to access. Uh, we provide, at a bare minimum, uh, connections to the metadata, which is the documentation of the data, so that folks can understand it and know, and know where to get it. Next slide, please. Leveraging the work of the West Coast Ocean Data Portal will make it easy for our effort to publish new data related to the offshore wind issue within the West Coast Ocean Data Portal catalog. For those of you who speak uh, Data Geek, uh, we're talking about either a web accessible folder or a catalog of metadata that's provided by the authoritative sources or through our own coastal program capacities. Uh, and those records of interest are harvested from across the region and added to the single curated catalog system. As an administrator of this system, together with staff of the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, we can register new sources. Uh, we can select uh, within each source systematically for those records we want to include. And then we can add that information to our uh, visualization tool. Next slide, please. So our approach from this is to curate one curated offshore wind catalog that intersects the catalogs of data that are available in Oregon, leveraging the existing investments in the state of Oregon resources to leverage the federal data catalogs that, that supply data um, at the national level or at the regional level and aggregate those all within an ocean wind uh, topic theme of our catalog. But I want to be specific about which data uh, sources and, and places in Oregon we will be using and how they have been used in the past. Uh, the first and foremost of that is that within the state, there is a statewide GIS framework system that the state agencies and NGOs and, and academics use to coordinate discussions about relevant topically themed spatial data. The coastal and marine data portion of that framework is led by our program. We keep all of the, the records uh, and the archive of, of the information we've used as a part of our marine spatial planning processes, as I discussed in the Territorial Sea Plan amendment effort, on the Oregon Coastal Atlas archive. Another way that we make the data available is uh, providing a list of the records that are available in the archive through our website, the Oregon Ocean Information page. So there's two ways that we, uh, the Coastal Management Program, provide 
data to our state uh, coastal and marine data practitioners that's uh, on the left side. Additionally, for the kind of rest of the data ecosystem covering terrestrial uh, types of, of information, including administrative boundaries or uh, elevation, um, that is provided by the statewide GIS data catalog uh, called the Oregon Spatial Data Library. Um, that entity federates data from around the state, including the coastal atlas, so that we, when we publish through the coastal atlas, it is consumed and then leveraged by the spatial data library as part of its collection. And then finally, you've heard uh, Jason Searman mention the Oregon Explorer uh, ERISA project. Um, and that project will be presenting the data from its statewide renewable energy assessments. Uh, and that will be available for us to uh, connect to as well. So that covers the state of Oregon GIS framework and the data catalogs that we will be using. Now there's a whole uh, system of federal data catalogs, uh, including the marine cadaster, the ocean reporting tool, uh, and, and many others that uh, the federal government, including BOEM and the Office for Coastal Management, have put together. Uh, those systems we have already demonstrated that we can connect to uh, through our catalog and so we can selectively harvest relevant information from them to add to our curated offshore wind catalog. Next slide please. So when you search our catalog all of the records from across the region that have been identified and harvested will be brought into the catalog. Uh, one more click, please. Uh, they, there will be a new issue area added for offshore wind energy, and the records that are brought in will all be curated with that tag. But then they will be dis, uh, automatically faceted according to location, extent, the source, the format, and the keywords that are, that are discoverable in the metadata. Um, and that will build a data catalog that we can all refer back to. Uh, there will be a tile on the home page of the portal that will direct you right to uh, the, the catalog of data that we have aggregated for the issue. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to switch over and talk about uh, the creation of a visualization tool to support our efforts. So like uh, data catalogs, we, uh, as a coastal program, have built a number of uh, marine spatial planning tool. And again, we want to follow a set of guiding principles in the creation of our tool. The first of which is we want it to be good at what it's supposed to do, which is provide access to the relevant data sets and the visualization capabilities in a flexible manner so that people can view the information that they want to view it uh, in the context of specific geographies or, or data themes that they want to investigate. Again, the system should be uh, based upon data that's produced by authoritative sources and, and served to us through web mapping services. Again, those need to conform to the ocean geospatial data standards for us to consume them. But we really want the source providers to maintain the integrity and the authenticity of the data that's available. In the case where you have project or grant related archives where entities that produce data but do not have uh, the, the vehicle or the means to publish the data through a services or a catalog, the Coastal Zone Management Program does have that capability and we will publish those resources where applicable. We will be uh, searching through a number of different relevant data sets. Uh, I've provided a very short list here, but uh, the list could be very long and detailed. Um, but we mean to cover the natural resources that are out there, uh, the human uses that are out there, the patterns of those uses, and an understanding about compatibility between those as we work towards moving forward uh, in our planning process. Next slide, please. So here's a, a quick uh, preview of our draft visualization tool. Uh, right now, we have 
uh, pretty much an empty container since this is a draft plan and we will be working in the near future to fill this out. But I wanted to provide uh, some basic explanations of its functionality. Uh, like most web map mapping tools to date, uh, you will have a browsable catalog of data on, as you see on the left side of the screen here. You will have a map interface that allows you to zoom in and out, uh, the bookmarking tool in the upper right that allows you to uh, save a map that you have created and send a link to that, which will not only store uh, the data layer that, that are active, um, but also uh, send the, the exact geographic extent that you are viewing uh, the map. Uh, next slide, please. I have uh, put this up to demonstrate just a few of the data layers that we've been able to add in uh, to our viewer to date. Um, just to give you a sense that from a visualization perspective, there's a lot of flexibility provided by the tool. Here you can see uh, research and telecommunication cables uh, together with uh, an annual average wind speed map. And uh, a user, when interacting with the system on the left, will be able to uh, reorganize the data from a visual hierarchy perspective. So if you click on a, a record and, and move it around in that table of active data layers, you will increase or decrease its visual uh, hierarchy. You will also be able to adjust transparency to uh, view the associated metadata and potentially uh, navigate to the source of the data that's being provided uh, to the system through the view. And then, uh, again, if, you're, if you want to confirm what's being presented on the screen, there's a legend tab. Uh, finally, there's a uh, flexible selection of base maps available at the bottom. Of, uh, and you can choose any number of uh, canned uh, base maps, including uh, the, the ocean, view by the ESRI company, as well as things like nautical charts from NOAA. Next slide, please. So that summarizes uh, our plan to leverage the capabilities that are available within the West Coast Ocean Data Portal to provide both a visualization tool and a catalog that we can reference as a part of our effort. And uh, at this time, we are asking, we are seeking, uh, that organizations who have an interest in looking at our data catalog and then helping us to gather uh, additional information and resources that uh, they want to see, uh, that we can do so. And so we, the state, uh, will be working with BOEM to convene uh, a group of folks to gather and re review data uh, that exists. Again, we will start with catalog of information uh, from our existing territorial sea plan amendment processes, as well as some additional sources that we have already identified through our alliance partnership. And we will seek to build on those and add new data and identify data gaps, and hopefully work to fill those gaps as soon as we can. As Whitney said, uh, we are now living in a somewhat uncertain future about the likelihood of face-to-face -face meetings. So I would imagine that, that meetings of a working group like this would be convened uh, virtually. And if folks would like to participate, and I would hope that especially task force members from federal and state agencies, uh, I would certainly welcome uh, their participation or the participation of their data uh, staff uh, to join us in this effort to uh, create the best catalog we can and the best information resource possible for us to move forward. Uh, next slide, and I believe that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. And this is Sylvia Chiborowski again, and we're going to open it up for our task force discussion at this time. And just as a reminder, uh, this discussion is for the task force members. Members of the public will have public comment shortly. I know that we have a hand raised from Mike Okonieski, so we'll call on you first for public input. And we encourage task force members to get your hands up, to get in the queue, to provide comments or ask questions. And really what we're focusing on here is any clarifying questions from, for Whitney or Andy from what you heard today, and any reflections on the engagement plan, as well as reflections on the data catalog and data visualization tools. 
We also got a couple of questions from task force members in the Q&A pod. So I'll read the first one out loud while people get their hands in the queue. So the first is from Mark Healy asking, is there a way to catalog where our data gaps are? And can we provide a table of data needs for Oregon offshore wind at the end of this data gathering effort? And I think I'll turn to Andy for that one. Yes, and thank you for the question, Mark. Um, we will certainly provide a table of data needs, uh, especially GAP, as we go through and identify uh, the existing and available resources. And um, I would suggest that both uh, we as a state and BOEM uh, begin to create a list of those data gaps and a prioritization of them so that we can then use whatever resources are available to address them as quickly as possible. Thank you, Andy. And Karen Braby with ODSNW. Hi, thank Hi, you. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, wanted I wanted to, to uh, uh, just generally just recognize, generally the, recognize effort the effort that's gone into, gone into the stakeholder engagement plan, plan and the data and information, the data plan. information plan. And I just want to share a reflection, share a reflection which, which is that, is that uh, conceptually, uh, conceptually the plans look plan good. good. And I think and what I think we've heard what today we've from a number of sources is that the conceptual, the conceptual plan, plan is only is as good only as, as, good as uh, it's, implemented it's implemented on the ground. On the ground. And so things and so like, things like um, um, the, the table the, the that, table that, that documents, documents calls with calls stakeholders, with stakeholders meetings, on the meetings on the coast, those are all good those things. Are all good things. I don't have a lot of specific lot of comments specific other, than other than how many, how many where. where. You know, who's going to be who's going included, to be in, that included in that list? And I think, and I think those, are those are the types of questions that a lot of, that a lot of uh, the folks on the phone on the and phone on this webinar, this webinar will be asking. Will be asking and, and the answer, the answer is, the is the difference between meaningful, meaningful engagement, engagement and checking and the box, checking engagement. box engagement. And so I just, so I just acknowledge, acknowledge that, that and offer that as a point. Thank you. And we also have another question in the chat from Mark Healy on how will call areas be determined and who will determine these call areas? So Andy? Oh, hey, Sylvia, this is Doug at Boom. I think that, <coughs> sorry, Andy, and I, I, I'll jump in first and then you can maybe if you had some additional information. You know, I, I think what the plan is and you know, what we're trying to do is develop an, an engagement plan that is not check the box. You know, we want to outreach, and I think that's the feedback that we're looking for. You know, we want to make sure that we're leaving no stone unturned because we do really want to hear from the experts, especially along the coast. Uh, <clears throat> with that said, you know, if we, as we go and we gather the data and information, uh, you know, it should be, uh, at least past experience shows us that there will kind of be areas that start to look like they may be appropriate for leasing. Uh, you know, and we'll do this in full coordination with the state. Uh, you know, we'll take the results to the task force. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, heavy dose of collaboration with the state and the task force, but BOEM will be ult the ultimate decision maker on deciding the call areas moving forward. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, I don't Doug. have anything to add. Okay. So any other comments, questions, or reflections from task force members? You know, and again, we heard Whitney present on the engagement plan, so we're interested in hearing if people think that that plan is um, appropriate and thoughts on virtual engagement in the time of um, COVID-19 and uh, reflections on interested parties as well as any thoughts on the data catalog and visualization tools. So we have a couple of hands. Um, let's see, Dave, uh, Commissioner David Yamamoto. Yes, uh, thanks so much for the opportunity again. Um, I, I don't know what the time frame is at this point. Uh, this pandemic has put uh, many time frames uh, on hold. 
Uh, I don't know what the plans of BOEM are. Uh, I, I understand we need to gather all the appropriate information. But again, I think one of the primary sources of information that this task force needs is input from the public. And doing this virtually, uh, just like we're doing right now, it's just, everyone needs to understand, it is just not the same as meeting in person. I know the question is, when will we be able to do that? Well, no one has anticipated this pandemic. And, and moving forward, just for the sake of a schedule, when, we're, when we actually can't do the best job that we can do, I think is wrong. So I would be one that would just want to put this off put these decisions off uh, until we can engage with the public. And I'm talking again, the public on the coast. We went through this once before with the Territorial Sea Plan Part 5 amendment process. And we were being told over and over again that if we don't do something and if we don't do it now, the feds are going to step in and do it for us. Well, guess what? That never happened. Uh, we took we took this case to the Oregon Court of Appeals, which took six years, and we won that appeal, uh, and the, the correct thing happened. So again, I'm 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 just not sure that pushing this through simply for the sake of a time frame is the proper thing to do. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Hey, and Sylvia. It's, well, it's, it's Doug again. Go Sorry. Ahead. It's, Hey, thanks, Commissioner Yama. We 100% agree. Uh, you know, we know that a face-to-face, -face, you know, and may be optimistic on our part, but we're intending to have face-to-face -face meetings along the coast. I mean, that is, we know that we're not going to be able to move forward in designating call areas without having those in-person meetings with the experts along the coast. Uh, I think there's enough flexibility built into the plan that we can you know, stretch the timeline. Like I, like Whitney said earlier, you know, we had the 12 month timeline in there that was pre COVID-19. You know, we still have the flexibility to change that. You know, it's there's nothing binding with the plan. You know, it's just kind of the framework that we can use. Again, heavy dose of collaboration with the, our state partners on making sure that we do an effective and efficient job uh, to make sure that we do get input into the planning process and. You know, we're hoping that everyone is going to be satisfied at the end of the day that when we come up with call areas, whenever that is, that everyone or most are satisfied with the outreach that was done prior to that. So thank you for your comment. Thanks, Doug. And Walter Chuck, did you have a comment? Walter Chuck, did you have a comment? You may need to press your unmute button or star six. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. This is okay. So, yeah. So yeah, I just want to thank you for the chance to comment and just want to uh I fully support what Karen and, and David said and, and the wrote a letter. And I just want to point out a couple things that, um, you know, now that we, due to COVID-19, I don't know if the timeline really is realistic to get true public input on the coast with having meetings. Um, I, I really appreciated Andy's presentation and it, wherever possible, if we can use the existing data that uh, the state has already com compiled. and as far as our fishing industry is concerned, I think you need to also make, be sure and understand that um, you have three areas on the coast, uh, you know, north, central, and south as far as resource areas, but uh, the, the boats that fish on the coast of Oregon, they, they fish the entire area. So if you're going to do something down in the south, you need to make sure that you reach out to the central and north coast um, because our, our fleet does cover the entire, the entire state. Um, those are my comments, and uh, th thank you for the time, and thank you, everybody, for their participation. Thank you, Walter. 
And we're also seeing a comment from um, Bob Main at Coos County in support of Commissioner Yamamoto. And Jason Miner, do you have a question? With the uh, assembled county commissioners that are online or have been online, I was curious how you're I know a number of counties are, are, you have a number of necessary processes that involve public input, like uh, planning commission hearings, some kind of model of, um, of a, a waiting room, and then they're continuing to hold some form of, a greatly diminished form of public meeting with one person or 10 people entering a room at a time to provide testimony. I'm curious if any of the coastal counties have gone to that for your public hearings or how you are handling public hearings now and maybe at this point in time, recognizing that in three months you may be in a very different situation of being able to either hold or not hold public meetings. So Jason, this is Commissioner Dave Yamamoto. So and I can't address that. You know, we are doing things because we need to continue to hold public meetings. Uh, we are doing things so differently today than we have in the past. We're doing live virtual meetings. Uh, with people able to make public comment uh, via email. Uh, but th this is out of necessity right now because we have to continue to maintain six-foot social distancing. And I understand the problems that currently we would have with trying to hold large public gatherings. And I, I don't believe you were around uh, eight or nine years ago when we held a public meeting in Pacific City at the Kaiwanda Center. Uh, and everyone was expecting 30 to 40 people. Uh, we ran out of chairs at 180, and that was concerning the Territorial Sea Plan Part 5 amendment process. So those are the types of things that we just need to be aware of. Those types of meetings are important to, to set the tone so that everyone understands where the coastal communities are. And again, when we'll get there, uh, unfortunately, I don't think anybody has, has that idea at this point. Thank you, Commissioner. And I believe that we also have a comment now from Lieutenant Commander Dixon Whitley. You may need to take yourself off mute. And we still can't hear you. You may need to either press star six or use your mute button. Um, but while we wait for that, I believe also Mark Healy had a question or comment. Um, no. OK, thank you. Okay, then back to Lieutenant Commander Dixon Whitley, if you're able to speak at this point. Uh, hello? Yes, we can hear you. All right, uh, good afternoon. I would just uh, encourage the, uh, the group to reach out to the Coos Bay Harbor Safety Committee and the Southern Ocean Resource Commission. Those are other public uh, meetings that do reach out to both the fishing and, com and commercial maritime industries in the affected region. And so they are good groups to be able to, to reach out and get answers to and from the local industry. And if you have any questions how to do them, I am a member of it. I can uh, reach out to the group if the commission so requests. Fantastic, thank you for that. And Mark Petrie? Yes. I, I'm I'm uh, trying to get uh, Shannon Souza to, um, she has some technical difficulties on the webinar. So I believe if she's on the call, um, I want to turn it over to her. She had a few comments. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Shannon Souza. I'm the program manager for OCEAN. As we said, we are a coastal initiative 
uh, really interested in expediting this inquiry and looking for opportunities to maximize the benefits to the coastal communities. We really want to acknowledge BOEM and the state agencies working on this. All of the access that we have had to staff and outreach has been fabulous. While we acknowledge that there is an existing process at play, um, we do and we don't want to get in the way of that. We would like to encourage and improve a little bit on that process, particularly in the area of buoy deployment. It's our understanding and that... Just one moment, Shannon. Um, we would prefer that you save your comment for the public comment period. And we'll see if there's any other task force members who wanted to uh, chime in at this time. We just have a Since few I minutes left with the task force discussion. Sure. Since I can't raise my hand, will you just call on me during public comment, yes. please? Thanks. Absolutely. We'll put you. We'll put you in the queue. Thank you. And other task force members, either raise your hand or if you're unable to, just go ahead and chime in. Commissioner Boyce here. Yes, anxious, uh, no hurry, but anxious to hear uh, Ms. Souza give a quick presentation there. Thank you all. Thank you, Commissioner. And any others here? Great. Then we'll go ahead and move into our summary of action items and next steps at this point. So I will turn it over to Whitney Hauer. Thanks, Sylvia. And I want to say thanks to everyone for their participation today and, and providing all the feedback that, that we've received so far. I, I think it'll make a more effective process. As, as part of next steps or immediate next steps, uh, we'd like to finalize the engagement plan and incorporate the feedback from today as well as any written feedback. So if you have any written feedback, you can send that to me by next Thursday, June 11th, using the, the comment tracker form. Um, additionally, if you would like to be a part of the data catalog review group that Andy outlined in his presentation, please let him know directly by email. And then as we heard on the call today with the state's commitment to offer when planning, Bowman DLCD would like to initiate this planning process with the implementation that's outlined in the plan. Again, thank you very much, and, and um, I'll turn it back over to you, Sylvia. Thank you. And I will turn it over to uh, Doug Bourne and Jason Miner to provide any closing remarks. So first to Doug. Great. Thanks, Sylvia. Just one minute uh, more of your time. I know we're running short on time. Uh, just want to say thanks to our state partners, you know, especially Jason and Andy and Patty. Uh, you know, we look forward, and the rest of the task force, you know, we look forward to moving uh, into the planning process, and I, you know, hope to see everyone soon. I also wanted to thank the non-task force members who have been, you know, listening to the meeting. Uh, I really appreciate you guys hanging in there and look forward to uh, listening to your comments and answering questions here in just a few minutes. And again, I just wanted to re reiterate Whitney's, you know, next steps. You know, we'll finalize the plan. Uh, I think in our schedule for the engagement plan, you know, finalizing the plan is probably the only thing we'll try to make sure that we stick to, and that'll be this summer. And, uh, you know, that'll be after we get all the input. So thanks a lot, and turn it over to you, Jason. Thanks, Doug. And I, too, just want to thank the task force for your participation in the virtual format. And, um, and I also want to thank members of the public for listening, and thanks. Uh, Suzanne, I think I had your name right. I know it's hard to, in a virtual format, raise your hand and then um, uh, have to wait for a comment and uh, entirely recognize um, the challenges around this format and how to participate as a member of the public. Um, I also just want to recognize that we're just making the decision to start the planning process here today. And that the, um, in the summary of the task force comments, I heard the comment that, you know, moving forward on the engagement plan, um, but also want to acknowledge that the purpose of much of this conversation, that engagement plan is, I think until June, the screen share slide has changed, but there's, a, there's still a period of time um, even to 
on that on that engagement plan itself. Um, there's a long way to go before any decisions are made besides the decision to go forward together in planning and to appreciate and respect the diversity of opinion that are out there on this issue. Um, and I would just say on behalf of the state and behalf of all the state agencies uh, that we look forward to the many areas of expertise that will inform these decisions, uh, including those offshore industries that Oregon has long relied upon for its resilience in the face of an uncertain future. Um, thank you all for your time and look forward to uh, public comment. Thank you, Jason. So then at this point, we're going to formally conclude our task force meeting and take a break before we begin the public input opportunity at 1120, which, when we will reconvene. And I do want to note, we realize there have been a number of audio issues, and this meeting will be is being recorded, and the webinar will be posted to the website. So if you missed anything, hopefully you'll get a chance to hear it again at that time. And we'll also have a written meeting summary available. So apologies for the audio issues, but we really appreciate your participation um, in this webinar format. And before we um, end here, I wanted to note that, that in the public queue, we do have Mike Okonievsky, Shannon Souza, and Kent Bressy. So know that you will be first. And uh, we also have Mike Conroy that just raised his hand. So just keep raising your hands if you'd like to get into the queue for the public comment. And um, we will call on your names at that point. Um, and we encourage task force members, of course, to stay on and listen for all the public comment, for all the public input. And when you do exit the meeting, you will be directed to a meeting feedback form. And we'd appreciate you filling that out just so that we can refine these meetings as much as possible in the future. And again, we're going to resume at 11.20. So I will go ahead and um, formally close this section. But I'll just kind of point to any other comments from either the BOM or state team before we end. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. And we look forward to hearing the public input at 11.20. Thank you. So we'll resume at 11.20. See you all then. Welcome back, everybody. This is Sylvia Chibroski. We're going to get moving into our public input opportunity at this time. And we know there are a few people that have raised their hands. So we'll get to you first. But first, I'll just review the protocols for our public input. Um, so interested individuals, we appreciate your input. And um, your input will be also going into a meeting summary that will be provided. And if you haven't already, at the beginning of the meeting, we noted that we don't have a sign-in sheet since this is a virtual meeting. So if you haven't already, you can use the Q&A chat to just tell us your name and affiliation and email address just so that we have that information for our sign-in sheet. And before we get into talking about the public input, I'm going to turn it over to Casey Cooper. At the beginning of the meeting, we also had a poll to understand what the affiliation is of members of the public. So she'll just provide that summary so we can get a sense of who is in the room. So Casey. Great, thanks. So thank you to everyone who filled out the poll. And from those who filled it out, we have around 5% are um, affiliated from the tribal community. We have 23% as federal agency. State agency, we have around 12%. Local agencies, around 2%. Elected officials, at 4%. Ocean users, such as sports, fishing, tourism, at around 10%. Coastal community or coastal groups, around 3%. Environmental groups, at 3%. Offshore wind industry, at 10%. Academic and research organizations, at 2%. We have consulting firms, at 14% interested members of the public at 3% and other at around 5%. Thanks, Casey. OK, and I'll go over the protocols for public input. So again, you can either make verbal input or provide your comments in the Q&A box. And if you do that, then we'll just read those comments out loud um, after every few uh, comments from the public 
And when you do speak, we just ask that you say your name and affiliation, and otherwise keep yourself on mute using either your phone's mute button or the microphone icon if you are connected through the computer audio. So with that, I will go ahead and move into the first folks in the queue, and I'll read the first three names, and then we'll keep going. So we have Mike Okonieski, Shannon Souza, and then Kent Bressy. So Mike. And Mike, we're not hey. hearing you. Are you on mute? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, apologize for that. Um, yeah, my name is Mike Okineski. I think you're actually pronouncing it the correct way. Um, if I was overseas, but I've been been in the seafood business now for 50 years, and I'm retired or just retired. I'm still uh, consulting for Pacific Seafood. The last 25 years, I worked had the good fortune to work for Pacific Seafood. We have uh, three Oregon facilities on the coast. Our headquarters is in Portland. And we have two oyster growing uh, operations in Coos Bay and Tillamook Bay. And so we're, we export to 26 countries. We have 3,000 3, employees, uh, 41 divisions, the last I checked. And so we're a relatively big seafood company, uh, maybe not big as far as some food production companies, but for seafood, we are fairly big. I, I uh, know Dr. Braby, um, worked with her on several things in the past, as well as a lot of uh, science center folks from uh, north, uh, Southwest and Northwest. And I've been a member of MAFAC as well, uh, which if you don't know, is an advisory group to the Department of Commerce that uh, goes through NOAA Fisheries. And I've been uh, participating in public process now for about since about 2020, or excuse me, 2000, in the council process and other organizations. But with that said, um, I started getting involved with the wind energy uh, I guess that exercises that are going on and attempted to get abreast of it here in the last several years and to get a better idea of what's going on. Since that time, I've joined Rhoda, and I am a member. And I would like, first off, to point to their letter. I think that it was uh, to the point and captures the feelings that a lot of us in the fishing industry have, that we are not uh, receiving much more treatment than getting our the boxes checked off, as uh, Karen Karen referred to, and that's unfortunate. I believe I, I think this. Uh, I am a believer in green energy or wind energy or anything that uh, can neutralize or reduce carbon emissions. However, I'm not in favor of trading one natural resource for another, and I think the fishing industry in general has. Uh, unfortunately found itself just wondering where, where, what we're going to have left when all this is done or how much of a reduction in fishing effort will we have to make in order to uh, have this happen. And so there's a lot of angst, and I, I, I would say anger, but I've seen from some people that have been involved in this process longer than myself. And I've met Whitney Hauer, um, Dr. Hauer, I guess, uh, some time ago, uh, she was uh, very forthcoming, and it was good talking with her. But I do believe, and it's been brought up uh, by David Yamamoto and others, that this process is leaving the fishermen largely out of it. And I think partially because of the people you're selecting to be involved, or I don't know what that process is, but it there's a large number of folks I've met, and I know people up and down the coast, um, from California to Dutch Harbor, and, and in general, they just feel like they're kind of being left out of the process. Uh, and, and that is really unfortunate because once that happens, then there's a matter of trust involved. And I think that's already 
in that erosion of trust has already taken place to a large part. I think that could be corrected if there is the proper involvement. But you're going to, if you want to really get, do more than check out the boxes, check off the boxes, then I think you really have to get down into these communities and meet with these folks on their turf and allow them to have participation that explains from their point of view what it is they're worried about losing. And, and Mike, I thank, thank you for. Thank you. This is, oh, go ahead. I, I'm just going to thank you and for allowing me to comment, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. And Shannon Souza. Thank you. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm with Ocean. And one of the areas, um, actually, to address that last public comment, it's come to our understanding that meteorological buoys are generally placed only after a call area has been established, um, that they collect a very narrow set of information that's really designed specifically to improve energy performance projections for financial investors, and that depending on the funding source of the buoy may result in proprietary data sets that public does not have access to. Um, at Ocean, we are thinking that it would be in the better interest of Oregonians to better understand the energy resource, yes, as well as the environmental context, biological interactions with fisheries, physical conditions of our offshore deep water environment as soon as possible to help make better informed decisions about where those call areas may or may not be. Um, particularly given our um, existing climate change, we've got all of our ocean, all of our, its inhabitants and the beneficial users are scrambling to rapidly adapt to climate change and don't have very much information about what is going on out there. Um, we have existing wind resource maps that are based on modeling, not actual measurements. We have Oregon universities on the coast with recognized ex expertise in climate science, marine biology, aquaculture, physical oceanography, marine engineering. Um, I, I do believe that with the upfront input and collaboration of those climate scientists, the fishing community, conservationists, energy harvesters, and developers, we could benefit um, for, from a, a larger scope in what kind of data is collected with a buoy and some upfront conversations, particularly with the fishing community, about where that buoy might be and what additional information they might like to see. Um, ocean chemistry, acidity, acidity, temperature, dissolved oxygen, physical attributes. Maybe there's an opportunity for biological observations. So as I said, OCEAN understands there's an existing process. Um, we applaud this process, are really happy that it's going forward, and we're looking for ways to expedite and improve it. Our intention is to directly engage with the fishing communities, other maritime concerns, and our academic and scientific communities out here on the coast to develop what would be preferred locations and a more comprehensive sampling scope for buoy deployment, and also to explore if there are any collaborative funding opportunities that various stakeholders could leverage to result in meeting these objectives and retain public access to all of the collected data. That's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. And Kent Bruffy. And again, if you'll say your name and affiliation before you speak, um, go ahead, please, Kent. Yes, Sylvia, are you able to hear me? Yes. Great. So um, my name is Kent Bressy. I am legal counsel for the North American Submarine Cable Association. And uh, some of you uh, <laughs> uh, with the state and also with BOEM uh, are familiar with our organization. Um, submarine cables provide more than 99% of U.S. telecom and Internet connectivity. Uh, they're treated as critical infrastructure uh, by the federal government, uh, and Oregon is a significant landing site for Trans-Pacific uh, submarine cables as well as cables connecting 
uh, to Alaska, Hawaii, California. Uh, and uh, NASCA, the North American Submarine Cable Association, has a long history of, of working with uh, the Office of Renewable Energy Programs at BOEM. Uh, although uh, we did not receive any particular outreach about this initiative um, and heard about it only through the U.S. Navy. Um, and we think it's critical that the industry uh, as a whole and individual submarine cable owners be included in this initiative given the critical infrastructure importance of the infrastructure and the need to coordinate. This industry works regularly with other marine industries and users uh, and stakeholders to coordinate in increasingly crowded ocean areas, and it's critical that coordination take place at the earliest possible stages so that nobody is surprised and that everybody can uh, try to um, uh, reach a, a common uh, workable position. Um, there are already provisions in Attachment G to BOEM's COP guidelines for offshore wind projects that call specifically for coordination with the North American Submarine Cable Association and use of its mapping tools, which are available on NASCA's website. We'd very much like to make sure that these are included um, within the data gathering and engagement plans being developed by the state and with BOEM. Uh, so going forward, um, I'm happy to provide uh, contact information directly uh, to uh, state and BOEM representatives to ensure more effective coordination here with submarine cable operators to ensure that the relevant data is provided uh, and uh, to enhance uh, the dialogue and ultimately the coordination going forward. Thanks for considering these comments. Thank you, Kent. We have a couple of questions in the Q&A pod, so I will read those um, and get some responses. And, or, and then I will go ahead to the other people that have raised their hands, which are Mike Conroy, <laughs> P.H. Florney, Jim Lennard, and Nick Edwards. So first in the queue, somebody suggested that we allow multiple selections in the future affiliation survey, so noted. We will try to do that. And we also had a question from Susan Chambers on why can only task force members submit written comments? So I'll turn it over to Whitney to respond to that one. Hi, Susan. Thank, thanks for the comment. Uh, this was geared for the, for the task force members, but it's, uh, we certainly look forward to the input, the verbal inputs here today. And if, if, there are, mem if there are um, members of the public that want to provide written feedback, um, they can send that to me directly. It's whitney.hauer at boehm.gov. And, and would like to, to uh, uh, incorporate comments. Thank you. Thanks, Whitney. And Mike Conroy, do you have some public input? Hi, can you hear and me Mike, now? Mike, you might be on mute. Can you hear me now? Hello? Hello? We're still not still able, to, not hear able you. to hear you. So we might just move so to PH Florney and then we'll come back to you, Mike. So PH Florney. Um, yes, hi. I could hear Mike for some reason. I'm not sure why nobody else could. Um, anyway, my name is uh, Peter Florno. I'm sorry I didn't realize how it was going to show up on the attendee list, or I would have put my whole name there. Uh, my office is the International Law Offices of San Diego. Um, I represent um, many of the Albacore fishermen off the West Coast. I also represent other commercial fishermen. Um, I had a couple of questions, and I'm not sure if, if with this format it's going to be possible for somebody to answer them or not. But um, my first question was uh, why it is that the uh, public comment is heard outside of the task force meeting. I, I don't know if I can count on what's displayed on my computer, but it appears that uh, 
very few, if any, of the task force members are uh, still on the line. So I don't quite understand what public comment, what good that does if the task force doesn't hear it. Um, second question I had was I'd like to know what efforts are specifically being made to uh, coordinate uh, with California, particularly since the, uh, as I understand it, the high uh, frequency wind areas uh, border on California's northern border. So I think that's quite important. Um, and my last question was, um, I, I think be, because I represent a lot of albacore fishermen, which fish up and down the coast uh, from California all the way up to uh, through uh, Washington into Canada, um, I'd, I'd like to know what the process is for getting information from California fishermen who fish off of Oregon into the Oregon part of the West Coast data portal, which I'm assuming is what Boehm is going to be looking at. So um, those are my three questions. I'd really appreciate answers if that was possible. Thank you. Hi, Peter. This is Whitney Howard with the BOEM office. Um, first, if you'd like, in the Q&A portion, you can put in your contact information as, as we'd like to have your, your contact information and, and appreciate your, your questions. In terms of the, the reason why this meeting is set up with the um, task force to begin with and then an official meeting closed and then a public input opportunity is because this task force is not charted under the Federal Advisory Committee Act, and our membership for the task force is then restricted to government agencies and governmental bodies um, from the state, federal, local, and, and tribal governments. Um, and we, we recognize um, that this is a limitation and, and want to make these meetings as available to the public as possible, and then we have the formal close and then open it up for the the public input opportunity. Um, I, I will recognize that this meeting there has been some technical issues and that we're not, uh, we need to make sure that we're hearing everybody's input, um, task force members and, and members of the public as, as we move forward. So that, that is a, 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 separate, a separate issue on this piece. Um, I also want to highlight, I think this was to your third question on the, um, in terms of the regional aspects for ocean users that of the Oregon um, uh, space, but but live in other in other areas, and, and we identified this in the plan, and and appreciate your your contact information, but um, want to extend that outreach to those um, other other fleets, for example, as you mentioned, um, but mentioned that we were anticipating holding the public meetings uh, there in Oregon, but there are other methods for engagement to to meet with, for example, fishermen um, by conference calls or webinars that live in Washington or, or California, for example. Thank you, Whitney. And this is Sylvie Chiborowski again. Um, Mike Conroy, we'll turn it over to you again, and I'm understanding that some of us might be able to hear you and some of us not, so we'll ask you to make a verbal comment, and then if you wouldn't mind also providing a summary in the Q&A pod, that way we can all be sure to hear it. I apologize for that redundancy, but Mike Conroy, I will turn it over to you now. Thanks. Can you hear me now? Oh, yes. Now we do. Okay. Perfect. Thanks. Um, my name is Mike Conroy. I'm the Executive Director of the Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Association. I also work very closely with the American Albacore Fishing Association and the California, and the California Wet Fish Producers Association. I was very, I was happy, very to happy to hear that, that some that users, users, that for some users, users or some user groups, the outreach from BOEM and other government, government agencies has been very good. I will note, I will however, that, however that, for that for commercial fishing and apparently, and apparently for the submarine cable, cable folks, uh, that, has uh, that has not been the case. 
you know, and this, you know, is, and this is not just a, 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 a thing that's, that's going on in Oregon. We, we, we've experienced the same issue in California, in California with relation to the call areas, 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 areas that have been established off California. So, um, and, I think, and I think that the, the letter submitted, letter submitted by Rhoda addresses, addresses this, so I'm not, this, so I'm not going to go into that, that even more. I do want to I do thank, want to thank Casey, Casey for her patience at the beginning of the meeting. I know I bugged the heck out of her with numerous text messages about getting kicked off. Not being able, not to, get being able to get back on the audio, the audio sounding, horrible. sounding horrible, it but it did work itself, itself out towards the end. Sorry, we crashed the bone website. I do. I will note, however, that the percentage, that the percentage of attendees may be off. Every, every time I tried to enter that data, I got kicked off the web the webinar. I do want to. I do want to echo Commissioner Walter Chuck and support his recommendation to reach out to other fishermen and women in Oregon. I would also recommend reaching out to fishermen in California who fish off Oregon, uh, which, as Peter just identified, includes fishermen from as far south as San Diego, California. I think Peter also identified the need to coordinate with the state of California, especially given the proximity of the Humboldt Call area to areas south of Cape Blanco. Um, you know, a large footprint that exists between Cape Blanco and Humboldt will have dramatic impacts on the fishing industry and its ability to provide seafood for the nation, which as we've seen during this pandemic, uh, our national food security is of utmost importance and should be considered going forward. I also want to echo Commissioner Yamamoto that we need to be mindful of the public process and not to be in a rush to reach for this newest shiny penny on the ground. Um, you know, it, strict adherence to a unrealistic timeline, especially given what we're currently facing with COVID-19 should should not be, you know, the way. We, we do need to ensure that all user groups and the public processes are complied with, even if it means delaying implementation of wind energy for a year or two. And with that, I will say thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And somebody needs to mute themselves. And we have somebody that's not on mute. That sounds to be on a seems to be on a phone call. Hey, Sylvia, we're working to identify that sound. Just please bear with us for one second. Jason Bush, can you please put yourself on mute? All guests have been muted. You can unmute, mute off, star six. Hi everyone, this is Casey from Kearns and West. I just placed the command on the phone line to mute everyone. Um, so if you are planning to get public comment via your phone, you will need to press star six. And if you have not muted yourself, please mute yourself right now. Thank you. Hi everyone, we just had to hit a mute all to stop whoever's audio that was. So please give us one minute while we bring back the audio. Hello everyone, this is Sylvia Tuberoski and can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you, Sylvia. Great, thank you. Apologies for that. 
we will try to continue with the public input opportunity at this time. And just a reminder, if you are calling in through the phone, please put your computer speakers on, turn off your computer speakers so that we're not getting feedback. And we'll continue with our queue. Before we do, we also had a question from Kent Bressy. And she asked, who is the FCC representative on the task force? And that person is Denise Coca, just in response to that question. And we'll keep going with public input. So next in the queue, we have Jim Lennard, then Nick Edwards, and then Scott McMullen. So start with Jim Lennard. And you will likely need to press star six on your phone to get off mute. Jim. Thanks, Sylvia. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, this is Jim Lennard with Magellan Wind. We are a company that is developing offshore wind off the west coast of the United States in deep uh, federal waters uh, with floating foundations. I wanted to first thank uh, BOEM uh, and the state of Oregon for convening this, the task force and particularly call out Andy Lanier for a very impressive presentation. I've been uh, sitting in on state task force meetings up and down the East Coast uh, for many years, and, and he made one of the most impressive state presentations I've heard. So thank you for that, Andy. Uh, I want to agree with many of the comments made by the task force members and some of the folks who have called in during the public comment period and agree that it is key to address all the stakeholder concerns. And I'd particularly call out, too, the commercial fishing industry's concerns, and the concerns of tribal nations. What we'd like to ask you to consider is intended to be consistent with the uh, state and BOEM's commitment to this extensive stakeholder outreach. And at first glance, it may not sound consistent, but we're pretty confident that it is. So our comment is, is also intended uh, to get a sustainable offshore wind industry stood up in Oregon a bit sooner than what it seems likely uh, will be the case under the current scenario. So here's our proposal. Our proposal is for the state and the federal government to publish call areas sooner rather than later, with the understanding that the studies that we all want, particularly related to the, the key stakeholder groups, will not have been completed. BOEM and the state could create very large call areas that can then be reduced before the wind energy areas that are subject to the auctions would be published. By having the call areas published sooner, we'll give, it will start a process that will shorten uh, the, the time that we have to wait before we get to auction, but will not eliminate all the considerations for uh, the stakeholder groups. Call areas are never allowed to be expanded. They can only be without a new publication and starting the process over. But call areas can always be reduced in size. So if we start with large call areas, that process runs parallel to the state and federal processes for studying those areas, and we get to a conclusion quicker. So we're doing things concurrently rather than consecutively. The best example I can give you where this has maybe caused a problem is in California, where there is serious consideration for a call area to be expanded, which will require then that a completely new process begin for that call area and the expanded area, and will delay getting, forward, getting us forward to auctions. So again, I want the stakeholders who care about commercial fishing and tribal nation cultural archaeological issues to hear me clearly. We are not trying to shortcut any of the studies or research that we all want, that you all want, but we think a concurrent process stands everybody in better position. Thanks very much for considering that. Thank you, Jim. Next in the queue, we have Nick Edwards. So Nick, and you may have to press star six to get off mute. How about now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Yeah, my name's Nick Edwards. Uh, I've been a commercial fisherman for just over 41 years now. I've owned three vessels. Uh, I've been licensed in all three states, Oregon, Washington, and California for various fisheries. Um, I'm, I've been a board member of uh, 
of OET, the Oregon Wave Energy Trust, in the past before they moved into POET. And I'm the secretary of Shrimp Producers Marking Cooperative. It's the largest group of, of fishing, of fishermen for uh, fishing pink shrimp on the Oregon coast. And I'm also a, mem a board member of the Bannon Submarine Cable Council and a board member of the Southern Oregon Oceans Resource Coalition. That's just for background there for everybody. Um, I really want to echo what uh, what Michael Onowski had said uh, earlier to take uh, it, it'll limit my time. But as, as the fishing industry goes down, um, you know this this path again, um, the letter from Rhoda expressing for total transparency for the for, for the for the Pacific Fisheries Management Council um, to be a member of this task force is essential to move forward. I I, I see no sense in having this task force without having them at the table. Uh, they, they bring a wealth of information that you guys will obviously need moving forward. And, you know, here in my local area here, you know, I, I can't help but to notice that some of the task force members um, with this newly formed Ocean Working Group, um, you know, are trying to fast track getting a buoy into the water, a LIDAR buoy for deployment. And I can give everybody on this call 300 million reasons why you need to vet the whole commission, uh, commercial fishing industry from Oregon, Washington, California. There's eight whiting boats down there fishing whiting off of Gold Beach and Brookings right now the last two weeks they've been down there. Look it up on AIS. That's only eight vessels. That's $300 million with an existing fishery. Um, before a buoy ever hits the water, we, we all have to vet all these industries where it might go. Uh, me personally, the further offshore, the better. But I can't pick a place. It has to be a group of, of, of the fishing industry reps along with, with, uh, with, with other entities that use the ocean there to where this might even go. Um, years past uh, with Source and uh, Scott McMillan and, and Susan Chambers and I were all involved with a, deciding for principal power uh, and putting a project in the Outer Continental Shelf. From the start to finish, that project went sideways to the commercial fishing industry. It did not. Uh, it did not follow like what everything was said to be, and the fishing industry was left out in the cold. Um, we can't have that again, and uh, I, I hope that as we move forward with this, we take our time. We don't fast track to even get a buoy in the water without considering all the existing user groups. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nick. This is Scott McMullen. Can you hear me? Yes, Scott, we can hear you. Go ahead. Yes, uh, my comment refers to a slide that I believe Dr. Uh, Whitney Howard showed in her presentation. It showed the Oregon coast. I'm sorry I didn't get the slide number. It showed the Oregon coast and the wind resource and the gradients uh, based on the uh, strength of the wind. And I believe it was that slide that also showed the area of the, the scope The scope was between three miles and uh, 1,300 meters, I believe. Is that correct? Can you still hear me? Yeah, uh, yes, that is correct. I'm hearing from Andy that that's correct. And I guess I would like to encourage you to look beyond, encourage Boehm to look outside that 1,300 meters, not cut off a hard line at 1,300 meters, which is about 710 fathoms. Um, currently, the Oregon trawl fleet is restricted in fishing to an area inside of about 700 fathoms. So essentially, all of the area that is in this potential for a call area is inside uh, our actively fishing uh, area, where uh, I think if you'd ask most of the fishing fleet, we'd say our grounds are well utilized now. So uh, what I would like to ask Bohm to consider is to look beyond 1,300 meters and extend, uh, extend the area so there might be a place that might be workable for uh, a wind energy project, but outside the area where traditional um, mobile and fixed gear fisheries are operating. Thank you. Hi, Scott. This is Whitney Howard at BOEM. Thank you very much for your comments. I just wanted to, to respond and let you know where that 1,300-meter depth 
came from. And it's our understanding from, from the industry, but also from our colleagues at the National Renewable Energy Lab, is that there's a limitation in terms of the water depth for floating offshore wind with respect to the mooring um, and anchoring that would be required for those floating systems. And that current technology um, is not possible beyond 1,300 meters, which was why um, that, that area was defined as such. But, um, but thank you for your comments. And if, if that's not the case, we'd, we'd certainly like to know. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Scott and Whitney. And we don't have any other raised hands for public input at this time. Does anybody else want to make a comment? Okay, well, we thank everyone for your participation. And I will just turn quickly to um, BOEM and to our DLCD reps to see if you have any final remarks you want to make before we end the public input opportunity. Thanks, Sylvia. This is Doug from BOEM. I'll say uh, I was hoping that we'd have more questions and comments. So if anyone has any more, we'll be happy to stay on the line. But if there are not, I appreciate everyone that did comment. I appreciate everyone that hung on to uh, to this point, um, we greatly appreciate the public input part of the process, uh, and you know, thank you very much. And hopefully, we'll be seeing everyone soon. Thank you, Doug. Hi, this is Adam. Oh. Go ahead. Hi, this is uh, Patty Snow. Uh, hi, this is Patty Snow, Coastal Program Manager with uh, DLCD for the State of Oregon. Just want to thank everybody for participating, and did want to mention that we will definitely look at um, the possibility of getting a PFMC representative on the task force. We think that would be we we had um, a PFMC uh, representative on the um, West Coast Ocean Planning Body, so we will definitely look at that possibility. We think that would be a good opportunity to bring the fishing interests onto the task force if it's possible. So thank you, everybody, for your participation. We really appreciate it and know that um, remote meetings like this are not the easiest thing, but we're really glad to have such great participation. Thank you. Thank you, Patty Snell. I think with that, we will go ahead and close the meeting, um, unless yeah, you have I'm any more. Thank you. I'll switch to a different. I switched to a PowerPoint slide. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you, Jason. OK, again, this is Sylvia Tuberski. And we'll go ahead and close this meeting. And we appreciate everybody's input and participation. And again, um, we will have the meeting webinar. This was recorded and will be available on the website along with the meeting summary that incorporates everything that was heard today. Um, so we look forward to your continued engagement. And again, when this meeting closes, you will be linked to a post-meeting evaluation form. So if there's anything else you wanted to add or any comments you have on the meeting, we would appreciate that um, at that time. So with that, I will go ahead and close the public input opportunity. And thank you all for your participation. Take care. <laughs>